Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm Simon Davey. I work at Canonical on Ubuntu stuff, but mainly uh, I don't do a lot of the actual bits that ship on the disk. Mainly, uh, me and my team, we run web services, and for that, we use an awful lot of Python, and we have done for a long time. And this talk really is about a tool that we've been developing internally. It's an open source tool to help standardize our uh, whiskey environments and our tooling, uh, particularly with a focus on production. So that's kind of where we're heading today. So this talk isn't just use this tool, that you're very welcome to. This is the first time we've done a conference talk about this tool, so some of these ideas we've been formulating inside haven't had a lot of outside input, so I'd really welcome input afterwards. Um, uh, we've made a lot of interesting decisions. I'd really like it if you disagree with us strongly and say you should have done this, then I'd really like to hear that. But also you should use this amazing tool that I'm about to demo for you because I'd really like to see uh, some more people using it. It's been a, sort of a work project, but also a, a, a sort of... Uh, a uh, hobby project for me as well, so I'm quite excited to be talking about it for the first time uh, at a PyCon. So, whiskey. We all love whiskey, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whiskey is not perfect, but it, 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 it uh, provided a common framework that's now been adopted universally across Python. I feel like we're not using that standard framework as much as we could, but and that's part of one of the reasons. Sorry? WebSockets. You're, well, indeed, there's lots of reasons why, but uh, the, the point is more that the, the, the community has adopted the standard, and it, it, we can do more with that. Um, so, if you run a Python web app, uh, there's a good chance you're using some of these tools. Put your hands up if you run a Python web app of any sort. Keep those hands up if you're using at least one of the tools on the left here. Right, there we go. So, there is an interesting thing in the Python eating system, I think, right now, is that there is a fairly well defined set of standard, standard tools that a lot of people use. Not everybody, but a lot. So we've got uh, DUnicorn is a very common whiskey runner. Django and Flask is web frameworks. Nearly everybody uses requests for HTTP. Quite like. We have Celery, which is probably the, the usual job management. And this is the I didn't know even post uh, Psycho PG2 had a logo. But they win the prize for this, for this one uh, until I look for this slide. And when you're running in production, you'll often be using a set of tools, maybe like this, this is what we use, but they're also relatively common. This is the Elk stack uh, for handling log aggregation. Elasticsearch uh, log slash Kibana, it occupies an interesting space, the same space as Jenkins. Everyone uses it because there isn't really anything better, but no one really likes it. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, we've been using StatsD for a long time, so much so that we have our own twisted StatsD daemon, rather than using the uh, default one. Uh, we're using a lot more Prometheus these days, and we use Sentry, which is a, uh, an error reporting tool and is really good, I would recommend it. Uh, so this, this, is, this is kind of a, a common set of tools that are used, uh, but it does take a lot of work to set them up and integrate them, and one of the problems I've been trying to solve is that one. So, a story, our, uh, about maybe two years ago, this is uh, what our code bases looked like. They were all high school teenagers, but they were all subtly different and unique and have their own special issues that needed dealing with. And um, so, uh, I, facing the impending microservices adoption within our, our unit, I recognised as someone who's kind of primarily responsible for infrastructure at the time, uh, uh, that we were going to have some problems if we were going to uh, continue with this model of having these, uh, not exactly snowflakes, but variation that wasn't welcome. What I wanted was something more like this. Um, a whole fleet of sheep, sheep that are cool. Um, so that, sheep that, that actually have some useful abilities from an operational point of view. But from, from an operational point of view, I really want them to all look like sheep, bar like sheep, uh, and but also be, uh, have that element of something extra on top of what we already have. So, one ring to rule them all, one tool to control all this, one point at which I, I as an infrastructure engineer, can influence how uh, we run our applications. So, I uh, had a look around, there's not a lot out there in the Python space that does this kind of tool. There's an, some interesting tools, uh, Twitter have a tool called Finagle, which is sort of the inspiration behind what Talisker does, and uh, I think Spotify have a tool called Apollo, uh, both in their JVM space, and they have a very similar kind of idea, some of the ideas are different, because the space is different, it's not Python, it's JVM, and it's a bit different, but that was one of the ideas. There wasn't really anything I found out there that did what I was trying to do, so we built our own, but I actually think that's not necessarily a bad idea, because this is a critical piece of our infrastructure, how we run our things, so investing the time seems like a good investment to me. So, I have some strongly held opinions, uh, as we all do here, but I'm talking, so I get to tell you mine. Um, uh, just as an overview, these are some of the guiding principles that I uh, was thinking about when designing this tool. First one is this. Uh, we've adopted many tools over the time, and some of them are really difficult and painful. 
uh, one of the things that I believe is that if you want a tool to be actually used by people, it needs to both be useful, as in it solves a problem for them, and usable, it needs to actually not get in their, in their way. And that's been one of the guiding factors, trying to make sure that this tool that I'm using, while it's production focused, it actually gives you benefit in development as well. Um, so that's been kind of a, one of the principles. Uh, stealing half of Postel's law here, being conservative in what you send, we've had a number of problems where uh, the defaults are, are various things have been sending large amounts of data or sensitive data to logging and aggregation <laughs> services. So I'm really keen that we, whatever we do by default, if this is going to be the default tool, is quite conservative. I mean, we can add more later, but right now I want to be conservative uh, so we don't leak information. Uh, uh, like uh, personal identifying information or, or secrets or, or blow things up by sending messages that are uh, too big. For example, some of our developers started logging the entire uh, JSON response to the post in a log message. It's 500k for every single log message. Uh, Kabana didn't like that very much. Uh, another one uh, is uh, production defaults. We've been bitten in the past by tools that in order to help onboarding developers easy, which is very valid, have gone with defaults that are not safe in production, either that they're not secure, or maybe they blow up and use lots of memory, and so on and so forth. So one of the designing, uh, one of the overall the design ideas is that we really want this to be out of the box, safe to use in production. If you, I think my view is that if someone uses your tool with the defaults and deploys in production and, and they get hacked, that's your fault, um, personally. So, Talisker. For those who don't know, Talisker is a distillery, a whiskey distillery on the Isle of Skye. I've been, it's very nice, I highly recommend it. And it is a, a single malt whiskey, it is quite strong, it is quite peaty, it is not to everyone's taste. Whiskey, sound kind of sounds like whiskey, and it's opinionated. You see the idea. Plus, it was taken. It was a uh, was free on Pipey Island. So <laughs> right, indeed. Well, the classical flask is a bottle, right? Yeah, bottle is whiskey. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Ah, right. I didn't know that. So the chain all the way down. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so the plan is to integrate all these things. Um, well, in the previous services, when we spin up a new code base for the new Python thing, what we do is go and look at the old code base and see how it integrated Statsky and copy that across. Right? <laughs> exactly. As Likewise for everything else. Everything was totally different and it got changed and where it was integrated, maybe they do century integration but only at a, to a certain level and not all the way through the stack. So the plan is to integrate all these tools, um, uh, not actually distribute them, but a, a tool that can run them with a pre-integrator so you don't have to do all the work of gluing everything together. The other goal here was a single point of control. Um, when we want to change the way that we were logging uh, or change the way we wanted to do uh, metrics, we didn't want to have to go to um, lots of, uh, and repeat that, that integration work, that change work in every single place. We wanted one place to do it and then we can all upgrade all our apps to use that version that supports this new thing. Additionally, I don't know how many of you test your integration code, your glue code, Harry does, winner. But um, the, the, we, wanted, we wanted to have a code base that was treated like any other code base that would be automated, have automated tests, uh, pre-merge uh, tests and all that, all, all the usual stuff we do with releasing quality software. We wanted it to be released in version so we could say, well, this we need to upgrade our applications to version X. Uh, uh, it's currently on version Z, that kind of thing, so we know where we are in the world and what's working or what isn't, rather than having to go inspect every code base to see what the state of the project was. Uh, then it was documented, <laughs> so a, a single project plan a place for us to document all this stuff and, and take, tell our developers how to integrate. Um, and audited as well, if we have a security issue or a uh, performance issue, we can. It's one place to go. Well, hang on. Why was why were why were we overloading our log server? What were we sending? We can fix it in one place. We can look at it in one place. So, essentially, what Telescope provides is a number of tools that are drop-in replacements for some of the standard tools that you would use if you're using this stack. So, Telescope Unicorn is just G Unicorn, except it wrapped in Telisca. It takes exactly the same command line arguments as G-Unicorn, the same help, the same everything. It doesn't change anything, but all it does is set up the Telisca environment, the logging, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the metrics, and the error handling, and all the rest. Likewise, for Celery, we have a Celery worker, a Celery job that can run workers and other things, and that give you all the same um, uh, integration that you will get. And we also have a generic Telisca.run, which can just run any old Python script, but in the Telisca environment. Uh, so this is really useful for things like cron jobs. You now get metrics from your cron jobs. You get century reports if they fail. They're now potentially first class entities in your system, uh, which is something the work we had kind of done but not properly, and this was attempted it properly. So metrics. We've been using Statsd for a long time, so we started with Statsd. 
and we're using more and more Prometheus, so uh, we support um, Prometheus, we support uh, scraping Prometheus from G-Unicorn, which is non-trivial and messy, but it, it works out of the box. Uh, the main thing is, what we want is a default set of metrics. When we looked at our uh, Grafana dashboards for our metrics, we, some services had these and some services didn't. This provides a common baseline. Red is a rate, errors and duration is a fairly standard um, way of measuring uh, anything that happens on an event-based thing, like HTTP requests, so the rate at which things happen, the number of errors, and how long it took. Um, so we get that for HTTP responses, how long does it take to unicorn your app to serve this response and get it out, you get, you get that out of the box. Likewise, for upstream requests, if you're using the request library and you call out to another service, you also get metrics for that too. Um, uh, likewise, for celery tasks, it, you get metrics of whether it failed, whether it retried, how long it took. Uh, and so on and so forth. And likewise, for scripts, you get metrics. You, the name of the script it gives, you, gives you a metric by default that um, uh, says how long, it, how long it ran and whether it failed and all that kind of stuff. So again, just out of the box, everything we've got a standard base of the metrics that we're emitting from our services. A standard set of URLs. So um, uh, one of the things we often have was the, the, like the Nagios check URLs or the health check URLs that we might have are subtly different between projects depending on when they've been written and so on and so forth. So we standardized a bunch of things. We have a ping, which is just a simple HTTP, am I up? You know, basically no message. You've got a check, which is uh, overridable by your application. So you can do deeper checks, like is the database up and whatever you want to do for your application. Uh, we have a metrics endpoint, which is the scraping endpoint for Prometheus by default. So our, our, in our infrastructure, uh, um, Configuration tools, we just hard code these. They're the same for all our applications, which is great. Um, and we have a few um, test uh, things. One of the things we found that is if you, your error reporting tool, whatever you're using, says you've got no errors, then your error reporting tool is broken. <laughs> so um, this is um, uh, one of the ways we generate an exception to test that our sentry is actually working. And sometimes you get, you get a sentry report for the week and there's no errors and you're very suspicious and you go and hit this URL. Uh, internally from a secure VPN, uh, it's not exposed on the public, and you can say, oh no, it is working, and there were no errors. Ha! Ah, crap, champagne. Um, similar for StatsD, as our stat, because uh, StatsD is a bit hard to check, it's UDP, so keep firing it until you get something through. Um, and likewise, with Prometheus, generate a Prometheus metric, we can test that it's all the hookups and integrations are working. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've wanted to do but haven't done yet is a, a sort of underscore status slash info, kind of inspired by mod status in Apache, if anyone's used that. Um, this would list things like uh, what Python packages you've got and what versions. It's human readable, kind of, can I just eyeball this and see what the problem is and so on. Maybe a bit, uh, idea of busyness, sort of human readable idea of w w what's going on with, it, with, the pro with the service at the minute. So error reporting. Um, so we have, so this go will by default configure um, central integration everywhere, so for your WSGI requests, um, specifically if you're using Django or Flask, you can enable deeper integration, like normal, but it's just a little bit easier because it's already been set up for you. Um, and that will give you specific information like the Django view you were on and so on and so forth. Likewise for Celery Task, if your Celery Task blows up, you get a, a Century report. And likewise, for the script for to list to run, if that blows up for any reason, you'll get a Century report that will be right alongside your other Century reports. Um, one of the things that Century uh, provides is the ability to add breadcrumbs as you walk through serving a request or whatever the unit of work that you're doing. <laughs> And um, so we, Taliska by default sets up uh, every log message gets added as a breadcrumb, every SQL query gets added as a breadcrumb, more on that in a minute, and all your app upstream HTTP calls with the request get added as a breadcrumb. So when you look at that error, you've got a lot of context to help you figure out uh, what exactly what goes on. An example of the uh, C, oh, it's a bit small, isn't it? Uh, hopefully, you, uh, yeah, you can't read that. Never mind. That was an example of the SQL. I would say on, on the principle of um, being conservative in what you send, all you get here is the shape of the query. You don't actually get the bind, the, the bind parameters. You, you get the question marks or the percent s or whatever because we don't want to leak any information. But usually the shape of the query is often enough to point you at the index that might not be working. Uh, so that's the default. Tracing. Um, so we add uh, request IDs into everything we think that it might be useful. If there's not a request ID uh, on the request when it comes in, we add one, and uh, it's added to the response as it goes out. It's added to all log messages that Taliska generates, so you can search via that. It's added to any out upstream HTTP calls, so that you can see the fan out. So one request comes in and generates four HTTP calls to services. Uh, likewise, uh, for celery tasks, you can see when a celery task runs, if it was started by a web request, 
It'll have that request ID in there so you can see where your work's been generated. And uh, your central reports also have request ID, so if you do get errors, if you get the request ID and the response, you, your tooling can go and say, well, here's the URL for the, uh, the century that's going to match the century job that's matching that uh, error. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more deeply, briefly, about logging, because it's one of the more sort of controversial, probably different takes uh, we've done. Um, so logging in Python, uh, the standard library logging is ubiquitous and highly configurable, which is both good and bad. Um, there are lots of problems with it, and people have commented on those on the year, but it is ubiquitous, and all our libraries use it, so that's what we use. And there are various third-party uh, logging tools, but uh, we, we really want the logs from our libraries to just uh, work. So one of the things we do is log to standard error. Um, this works in development. It handles it when you fork processes. They all share the same uh, file descriptors, and your app doesn't care about logging to a file, or paths, or, or, or anything like that, or file permissions, which we found previously to be... Uh, a constant source of pain, um, and your operating system does the persistence of that log and that rotation. This is fairly standard if you follow the 12 factor app design that is in there. The only difference is we do it in standard error because Python buffers standard out by default. We could disable that, but it's kind of interesting when you do the corner cases and things. So standard error just works. <coughs> Interestingly, the one place it doesn't work is if you are using to this up run to run a con job because your standard error will make you think the con job's failed. So you need to know that. <laughs> but it's not perfect, it's what it is. Uh, and we still want on this logs because we often are deploying our infrastructure in a test environment in containers on our laptop, and we want to um, uh, actually see on disk logs. We haven't always got Kibana or something to look at them. We use a variation of logfunct, which is uh, kind of came from Heroku. If you look at Heroku's book default output, that's what it is. It's a simple key value pair. It's not that easy on the eye. This is what it looks like. We use a hybrid <coughs> format, fairly standard Python timestamp level logger, the message, and then arbitrary key value pairs um, on the left. And because that's not easy to read, by default in development, you'll get colors um, generally, which uh, uh, is generally more useful to highlight the important bits of the message for when you're doing local development. Uh, we also want to support debug logs, but we don't. We, that, as obvious in, in production, you need that, in development. You obviously need that in production. You also sometimes need that, but you don't necessarily want to send that to your log aggregator. One time, it could be ten times the volume. Yeah. Uh, secondly, you could have. You, you don't. If you're using a third-party library, you don't know what they log, and they may log sensitive things. So you just don't want to send that to your aggregator, but you sometimes want them. So um, what we have is an environment variable that's set with a path. If that path is writable to, we'll set up a logger to it. And it's limited, it's designed to be ephemeral, it's limited by time, it rolls over and limited by size. Uh, and it gets all log levels for debug stuff. So you get that locally and you get that in, um, in production, but it's never sent to standard error, therefore it's never aggregated and never sent out. And usability, you just use the standard extra. I don't know if people are aware, but the logging API supports this extra parameter with a dict. Anything you put in there is appended as a key value pair. On the end, there are rules about how things are serialized, but I haven't got sort of time to go into them. Also, if you want all of your code to have a particular context, so you've got an application object ID and you want to say I log everything with this ID, you can use this, which sets up the thread local uh, because the code it sucks, but uh, logging is global, uh, unfortunately, in Python. And operability wise, we use Logstash, which has a tool called Grok for passing these things until it's shipped with a Grok filter uh, that's tested as part of the development that will pass this format and stick it into uh, Logstash for you. And when we use Beats or Logstash forward, it's add additional fields like host name and network and whether staging and production and a bunch of extra stuff like that. Okay, so uh, releasing software is hard. I guess we all know that. Um, this is released as a, a PyPI project, but we consume it internally. And one of the challenge versions of Talisker, which don't do all this stuff. Um, and one of the things I found is, um, not so much writing the documentation, but I guess organizing it and laying out the documentation so it's easy to find what you need. It's been a challenge for me. I did the classic sin of reflecting the code in the documentation. One documentation file per Python module. <laughs> Not always the best way to organize your code. Um, but what has worked is it, 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 it's got proven benefit uh, in terms of uh, our developers are actually enjoying using this. Initial, initially there were some bumps as we fixed bugs and things, but now generally the adoption is uh, everyone's very happy with the tool. We have this interesting network effect as we add more and more things to the tool, it became more and more useful, and the adoption kind of went, oh yeah, we need this more and more. And it's a good foundation going forward where we're in a, we're in a good position, we're happy with where we are. Further work, uh, to actually cut a 1.0 release, 
There's a tool called Concheck, which I want to talk about. Open tracing, which someone asked me about earlier. Yes, so uh, I said more detailed tracing and request IDs. More Prometheus integration, because we're moving that way. We have a Go version, but we haven't released it. We'd like to do that. That's a similar idea to what we're developing tooling. Is there any time for questions? Um, yeah, we've got three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. Okay. Harry. Uh, how does it work? <laughs> so I'm more than happy to talk details, I only had 20 minutes, but it, essentially it doesn't do anything fancy, it's not that much code. Um, uh, the standard logging stuff, the standard library logging stuff has to be done at import because you've changed the logger class. That's how you do the logging, it's the only way, sadly, with the current Python logging API. Uh, everything else, all it does is just set everything up, plug in all the various APIs, set up all, all the stuff that the sentry docs tell you to do, it does. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a few integration APIs, for example, if you want the SQL breadcrumbs, you have to use a particular connection factory in your SQL Alchemy or Django Orm thing, but it's all documented in there, and you use that and you get the breadcrumbs on your... Uh, they also just slow query logging on the application side as well. So, I don't understand. Right. I mean, I don't want to spend it forever on it. Right. Um, you know, so if I want to set me, I probably have to set up a bunch of settings in my Django settings on my... Right. So how does it do that? So, okay, so the environment variable, Sentry DSN, it's the standard way of configuring this. Uh, it, the Django and Flash specific modules all still work. There's documentation, that you, 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 rather than doing from Sentry.flask support, yeah. import this, you do it from this, <coughs> so all the settings still work. So, um, configure, sorry? So all the, set, all the settings for Django and Flask Sentry integration still work in that effect. So you can configure it exactly like you would normally. It's just the class you import to do so is from Talisker on the Sentry. It just wraps the Sentry one, so you get some defaults. Um, that's all. So, um, oh, sorry, I think the yeah. Ray was first. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, what does your deployment process look like with Talisker? Does this change anything? No. Do you do? Sorry, like a soft question. Do you yep. do continuous deployment? Yes. Yeah, this is just like using GUnicol from from a, a, an operational perspective. Um, yeah, just you, you're expected to log to standard out, standard error. You can always, of course, add your own login and do different things, but it, it's no different from anything else uh, that, that does that. Do I understand that when you make a, a request, that the request ID from the current uh, local is thread local is passed through to the service? To the outgoing request. Right now it is, yes. One of the things that would be the change is if we did open tracing, can you spam? Okay. Uh, yeah? Um, how is it? Is it retro benefits? It should be dropping to get 80% of the benefits. That's the goal. If it's not, I really want to know about it. Have we got any more time today? Um, yeah. I think we've got a few more oh, minutes. Yeah. Okay, so there was a hand back there. So the question is whether or not we can use aggregators other than Sentry. Uh, so essentially just log, I mean, log aggregation or error aggregation? Yeah, so we've got to use mobile now. Okay, anyway, so, just so this, right now this tool doesn't integrate support for that, it could do. Okay. It's probably not something that's a priority for us because we don't use Rollbar, but it's an open source project and pull requests would be uh, yeah, very welcome. It, it, it's quite a bit of work integrating it in all the places. Yeah. Uh, and doing it optionally supported is a bit tricky. A lot of these things are optional, you don't have to use them, but right now things like Unicorn you do have to use, which I'm going to fix. And that's you with support. Um, at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I've got a working Flask application now, mm -hmm. I can just drop Talisker in mm -hmm. and then replace the, the right classes and whatever, and it will yes. just all yeah. work. That's the 80% that, goal. That's yes, the 80% goal. goal. So you get the metrics and the logging and everything else right. from Unicode out of the box. Where you'll need to integrate is if you want more flat specific info, intro in your Sentry reports, you'll need to do a little bit of work, just including the class. Likewise, if you want things like the SQL breakers, you'll need to use that connection factor. There's no way to configure that globally. And are you around until Monday? I'm around uh, today oh. and tomorrow. I'm leaving tomorrow night. So if you, I'm more than happy to spend the next 36 hours talking about <laughs> 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 <laughs>